Good morning. I am so glad to see you, and I hope that today has started off on the right foot. And if it hasn't, that's okay too, because we are going to go ahead and move out of that funk and just praise the Lord. So come sing with me uh, to God be the glory, great things he has done, um, which is so true. <clears throat> And if, once again, if you don't know the verses, uh, sing the chorus with me or hum the tune. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life a redemption to win and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. <clears throat> oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes, that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Hopefully there are great things that he has done over this weekend, and let's praise him through prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for the great things that you have done. Thank you that before you set the foundations in place, before any of this happened, um, you knew us, you knew of this moment, and we praise you for your saving grace through Jesus Christ, um, your Son, our Savior. I pray, Lord, that you um, show up in this lesson and touch each of the lives as we sit and um, at your feet and learn um, how to be stronger in our faith and bring others to you. In your precious and holy name, amen. All right, so another Jewish festival I know has already started taking place. This is the booth of festival, uh, festival of booths or tabernacles. Um, it is a reminder to the Jewish nation that they were freed from Egypt. And, and so during that time period of wandering and that, that transition from going to from Egypt into the promised land, they stayed in shelters or booths, and God took care of them. You know, he provided manna and quail, and he also provided uh, water. Now, you may go, what is the great big thing? You know, Jesus practiced all of these things. He was fully man, fully God, and you know, he could have said, I don't really think we need this anymore, but you know what? He didn't, and 
as believers, we should know about these festivals because they it does, as I've said before, have bearing on us. In fact, if you look up uh, Jonathan Kahn, C-A-H-N, um, and you look up the the this particular festivals of tabernacle tabernacles, um, he of course being a messianic Jew is going to be able to give you a better overall picture of what this is so important. And he brought to he brings in his lesson that uh, that this is this is where Palm Sunday came from. You know those waving of the palm branches, this practicing. Um, of of living in booths for seven days. And, you know, once again, seven days is the day of completion. And they celebrate and they give Thanksgiving. Oh, we're going to be giving Thanksgiving next month. How exciting. This is just so setting us up for a thankful and grateful hearts. You know, we are in our tents, our bodies are these, these living tabernacles that are frail and are wearing out. And we are promised that we are going to have the perfect bodies, the eternal bodies that don't wear out. Won't that be great when you don't have uh, mental health issues or heart issues or, or stomach issues or vision or hearing? Any of those things, it's going to be different. It's going to be better. It's going to be perfect. We are living in temporary bodies. We are living this earth is temporary. We are waiting for that which is to come, which will be permanent. The established kingdom forever. That should be exciting. This So the seven days that, that is taking place. Take that time to be thankful. Um, I saw this on Pinterest and... and uh, of course, there are Pinterest fails and things, those that are familiar with this particular website that teaches many crafting things. But for the month of October, uh, even though this is the fifth day, I challenge you, I saw this um, for your, many of people are doing decorations um, for the fall, and I'm decorating for the fall, is to start a Thanksgiving pumpkin. And what you're going to do is you're going to write, and I haven't done this yet because uh, I've been waiting to do this with my family, is to put, I am thankful for right here and let everybody write something all the way, filling this up, uh, maybe at every meal time or at least the, the meal that you're sitting together. I do hope that you have family meals. I am very insistent on it and they know that I get very upset when we cannot sit together and worship or eat together. That family needs that that bonding moment. So what are we thankful for? And then keep writing until the day of Thanksgiving, the American um, Thanksgiving, and you will have so many things that you can thank God for. What are you thankful for? I mean, what a great tradition to start. You know, and you might say, well, that pumpkin's awfully big. You know what? That could be true. Or what if I don't have a pumpkin big enough? Well, part of my decorations is two pumpkins this size that are white. So there's lots of different things that you can decorate with. I suggest start a new tradition. Start this with the Feast of Booths or festivals. Um, this world is temporary. Knowing that this world is temporary, why not store up the treasures in heaven? And the best treasure that you could store up in heaven is bringing other people to Christ with you. Look for those opportunities. I have a special prayer request for you, and you all are going to laugh. I shared it last uh, yesterday in my Sunday school class. I, I went to Sunday school, and I said, I have an unusual prayer request. And if my dad is listening, he will have to chuckle. Please pray for my dad and my mom. They do not get to go out as much as they used to. And so by being limited in the house, they do not have the witnessing opportunities that they have normally had. And so, you know, you can only witness to your plants so many times. Um, <laughs> so pray that my parents have witnessing opportunities 
to share Christ, to share the, you know, my dad is almost 84 years old. And I, he is a testimony in saying, you know what? You may retire from your job, but you never retire in this lifetime from the kingdom of heaven. And if you think that you should be retiring um, and not sharing Christ, you have the wrong, you have the worldly mindset because we are, we are not called to do that. When we retire is when God calls us home and we're done. I mean, because there'll be nobody to share Christ with in heaven. So I encourage you, please pray that, that there's just, you know, and I'm praying this for you all, that there's a pouring out of people because uh, there are a lot of people that are afraid. And as Christians, we should not be afraid. When we read these stories of Daniel in the lion's den, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was no fear. Even Jonah did not have fear. He ran away from God. He was willing to end his life <laughs> so he could be done and not have to go to Nineveh. And he was swallowed by a great fish. Um, Paul spoke boldly. You know, John was boiled in oil and he didn't go, oop, I didn't see that coming. I don't want, I don't want, you know, and of course there is, nobody likes pain. But I encourage you, go for it. You are free indeed. You're, you were crucified with Christ. You have the freedom to bring heaven on earth where you are. Heaven is already perfect, so let's bring some perfect here. And so in order to do that, we have to start living it and, and, and being not afraid. You know that Goliath, that David and Goliath moment? Don't let fear be your fearful giant, the giant of fear. No, we've already won. Remember, we are present, has not got up to our, our future. John saw us on the horses. The battle will be happening. We're wearing white. Guess what? We just stand there or, or on our, sit on our horses and we see Jesus speak the word and it's done. Whatever that word is, I, I, I'm sure it's, it is finished and it's over. And we live a resurrected, perfect life in a perfect world. What more can that be? It's going to be more than what we can imagine. Live boldly. So, that's not our lesson. Our lesson is Genesis 16. Theologians point out that this is the second uh, conflict of the promise, the covenant that God gave. The first part, and I didn't mention this, is the conflict of the land. You know, sometimes God removes people from our, our presence so that he can continue to do what he has planned and promised for you. Abraham um, or Abram and Lot are dividing the land that God promised Abram. Abram is giving what is not even his yet to Lot. Um, God removes Lot due to conflict among the shepherds. He uses that conflict to move Lot out of the way because the land is not promised to Lot and Abram. It is just promised to Abram. And there's to be no competition. There's to be no question who the land is for. In fact, God establishes that with Abram. And uh, so now in this section is that, that promise of who is going to be an heir and how is that heir going to be happening. So we read in chapter 16, starting with verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go and sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And this happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. You know, it's interesting that there's an interesting thought that Hagar, was a, whilst, though she was acquired in, in Egypt, she was one of the daughters of Pharaoh um, at this time. Uh, women, the, the, the balance, the equality has changed because of sin. And so women were seen as being married off or given by their fathers um, or by men. Uh, they had 
in, in um, a lot of cultures started to have less equality in, in a voice of who they were. So in the custom of Canaan, if a married couple did not have children within 10 years, it was expected that the man marry someone else to produce a family line, particularly a male heir. And it's obvious that Abram and Sarai were married longer than 10 years because now they've lived in the land for 10 years, so they would naturally by that time know the customs and expectations of the area. And because there was not an heir, it would be natural to, to take on a, another to, to, produce, to produce an heir. Uh, Matthew Henry notes that the matchmaker in this situation is Sarai. Um, since she's not born a child, she's found someone she thought would make a suitable surrogate to further her status. They could do that back then. Um, even today, you know, a childish family, a childless family is looked upon in question when they don't have children. You know, it's that natural tendency. Do you plan to have children? When do you plan to have children? Um, is there something wrong with you that you all don't want children? Um, and, and usually this comes from people that do have children because we say, this is amazing. This is the best thing. Yes, you have sacrifices um, and, and such, but wow, to bring other people into your life, to share, build a, com a little mini community, that's just wonderful. And then we, we become shocked when we hear, well, I don't want children. How could you not want children? <laughs> society just go, what do you mean you don't want children now there are some places where you know there's we've got too many kids is is that particular attitude um i have grown older as a, <laughs> as most of us do if we're still alive and understand that that sometimes maybe um it's a good thing for people who uh say they don't want children, don't have children, um, because it is a huge commitment to have um, one child, much less several, and, and not just an emotional, but it's a financial commitment, and um, so, so uh, there is also the, that piece, but then there's that piece of when you're trying for children, and you can't have them and then there's this stigma that we usually place on the woman of what's wrong with her and there's this shame because we've put an expectation that women should be bearing children i mean that's the only way the life happens um it does not matter what society how society wants to deem how how children come forth um let me just say Right now, there are two sexes. Biology says that you either have an XY or an XX. There's not something else in the middle. Men cannot produce um, children. It's not biologically possible. And so if you have a sex change to become a male, if a female does that, you're still biologically a woman who has done things to their body to produce a baby. But they're, you know, just because you think it, you can absolutely believe it. That does not mean that you're absolutely correct. Uh, so that's my stance on that. So God has made it to where women produce children. And when we cannot produce children, there's a lot of shame and stigma um, and, and this obviously happened during this particular time, the expectation fell upon women. Um, it was not considered that men might be part of uh, not being able to produce an heir. Um, and when we, when we say, well, God commanded his creation to produce um, and multiply it, be fruitful and multiply. You know, man distorted this command in having children outside of marriage and um, or through selfish neglect 
um, selfishness and neglect. Um, there are a lot are produced in the heat of the moment. Some are discarded as is garbage, which is biblically um, contradictory, which is very sad. And yes, God will 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 um, judge those moments. He cares for those that are what man tosses off and discards as a byproduct, an unwanted byproduct. I do believe that we should be standing up for the rights of children, unborn children, and children out of the womb. We should be standing up as a church. We should be educating our families. But that's a different story. You know, Sarai states the obvious. God has not allowed me to have children. With this, she provides the solution. Mary Hagar to produce our heir. Isn't it interesting that we do the same thing? When we know that God is in control, because she acknowledges that God is in control, and things are not happening like, like she thinks that they should be happening, you know, there's this time crunch, there's, there's expectations, what if I don't, I missed opportunity. Um, we panic, and then we take things into our own hands. And our attitude reflects that we know better than God. You know, we don't, and we don't even have a clue as to why he seems to be delaying and not moving with the time that is pressuring us. You know, God is, is outside of time. There is no time for him. And if we're going to talk about time, he always says, I am on time. At the right time, God did this, this, and this. So his timing is always perfect. Sometimes we just grow really, really impatient and we decide that that um, we need to help God. And that's what they do. We don't read that they say, when are we going to have a child? Because God hasn't revealed this part to him. Um, how much longer, you know, are we there yet? Uh, God, don't you know that the laws and customs say about, uh, of this land that this is this has to happen or, or my job? You know, all of these questions. And yet they feel the pressure as we do to conform to the laws of the land. And we should obey the laws of the land. They should, they, they are written um, godly morals are, should be in within our laws. When they're not, then yes, you do have the freedom to disobey because God's laws are always going to, to top or to trump um, man's laws. And um, there, there was this pr pr uh, pressure to conform. It is apparent um, that women were not producing babies later in life as the lifespan has, has drastically decreased. You know, or maybe, maybe we don't, the Bible doesn't say that women, women uh, bore children way into their hundreds. Uh, they may not have. Uh, they may have still had a very short window of time. Um, you know, we, we, we forget, even though while we are aware of God's promises and during the waiting period, we wonder if God has forgotten us. You know, the, the, did you, did, have you forgotten? Um, and, and so we are, we're eager and to see things unfold. We're, we're ready. We're, we're ready. We're that horse right there in the stalls, ready to run the race. And we're just waiting and we're chomping at the bits and the gate hasn't been released. And we're going to press on and hope that the gate will open. And so we take things into our own hands. Sometimes we pray about it and we're like, okay, Lord, Here's the situation. It's, it's very, very serious. I need an answer. I need an answer. Help us. And God doesn't move. There's this silence. There's this void. Um, we don't read that, that Abram prayed over the matter first. Um, to him... It made perfect sense. You know, sometimes we don't pray over everything. Well, Lord, should I pray over eating this particular meal or not eating this particular meal? Should I pray about making my bed <laughs> in the morning or not? Uh, you know, should I take a shower? I mean, they, they, 
common sense says, yes, you should make your bed. Yes, you should take a shower. And so we don't always, and, and here Abram is probably thinking, you know, God didn't say, he. all he said was that it wasn't going to be Eleazar. It's going to be through me. So, you know, Sarah suggested it. So it, it I kind of thought that would be a neat idea, but now that she is, she has brought up the idea, that means that she's open to the idea, and that way she's not going to be offended if I say something, because I know that's going to be a touchy subject, but Sarah, I said that. So, you know, this is that kind of adoption thing. She's okay with it. I could be okay with it. God's promised me that he's going to make a mighty nation. This makes sense. We're in the land of Canaan. He said we're going to possess it. So when in Canaan, do as the Canaanites did, right? Well, except for that, that idol worshiping thing. But, but this makes sense. It's a type of adoption. Think about that for a minute. It almost sounds like a story that we read way back in Genesis chapter 3. You know, Adam didn't ask for clarification. He listened to his wife. He knew better. He was having the conversations with God. Um, it doesn't record that Eve directly was having a lot of conversations with God. Abram was having a lot of conference. And I'm not saying that Eve and Sarai didn't. But the scriptures do not record um, that. And these were the men of the household. They were the ones to make the final decisions. And we don't read that they checked with God about that. Have a little check-in. Or I'm going to wait on that, that idea, Sarai. Let's, let's talk about that. Here's another thought. Hagar is a victim. You know, we don't read that her thoughts were considered. How did she feel about this? You know, she may have liked the idea of moving from slave um, or servant to second wife. Um, in Sarah's eyes, she was young, and she must have been seen as, as overall good to her. I mean, you know, Sarah, uh, Hagar might have treated her mistress really well. They might have formed a relationship of sorts. You would think that they would because they all prayed together. They worshiped together. Um, so Hagar would be introduced to um, Yahweh. Sarah, I doubt, would have chosen Hagar if Hagar was an awful slave or servant. Um, so we don't get any idea that she was disrespectful at this particular time. You know, it would be an honor to help out the family this way. Um, and so with all this rationalization, Abram seems to say, why not? I'll make Hagar my second wife. Um, Jewish text, here's another thought, um, appears, it appears that the second wife was expected to produce children and often was treated like a dog. So, you know, not everybody did that. The first wife would be more pampered and treated with respect. Uh, she was not expected to produce an heir. She would just be this thing of beauty. Um, so both, uh, kind of sad for both. Um, though not all households acted this way, but this seemed to become an adopted uh, process in some of the Jewish cultures because of how they saw everybody else treating their wives. And, and just because society shows what the norms are does not mean that those are God's norms. This is another reason why we should be reading the Old and New Testament is so that we know what God's expectations are for his children. Because if they're not godly norms, we shouldn't be practicing those things. Um, we should be standing up for godly norms. We should be... Um, disapproving of norms that could be harmful to 
society because you know what? If they're harmful for the family, they are going to affect society. It's going to hurt society. We must protect the institution of family. That is the smallest unit of society and community. We are our own little community when we have our families. And you may be um, just a husband and wife. You are still considered a unit of family. And so we read that Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had li been living in the land 10 years, Sarah, his wife, uh, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong that I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now she knows she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. How quickly we realize after the damage has been done due to impatience, how wrong we were in not waiting for God. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, I know many remorseful moments that have happened because of that. What happens next? You'll have to come back tomorrow, Lord willing. I'll be able to share that. Our Bible verses are still, we've got two more verses in Psalm 37, 1 through 10. Do not fret. Do not, do not, do not. That means whatever's happening in your area, do not fret of those who are doing evil. If your leaders are doing evil, do not be en envious of those that are doing wrong. If they're burning down your cities, if they're looting, rioting, anything, don't worry or fret like the world is doing. Be concerned, take care of yourselves, because for the like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. They'll go away. It's it, God is in control. As believers, we have no business being worried because he's going to take care of us. Trust in the Lord. So the opposite of fretting and being fearful is trusting. When you trust God, you cannot have both together. You cannot be fearful of man and, and trusting in God. When you trust in God, you have no reason to fear man because you're saying God is stronger and he is in control. Trust in God, the Lord and do good. So in the meantime, do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight. That means you've got to have that praise on. Here's my big heavy pumpkin right there. Get your praise on. Get your thankfulness on. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Give that to, your, to the Lord and then wait. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still. Praise him, be still. Don't be like Sarai and, and um, Abram at this moment. They needed to be still. Keep doing, keep praising, keep thanking, keep looking and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. He's saying it again. Do not worry. Do not fret. Refrain from anger and turn to wrath. Be angry at injustices, sin, but do not sin. Give it to God. Give it to God. Do not, do not fret. See, look at that. Do not fret. Again, it leads only to evil. When we start getting really angry and raging and we're fretting, it causes us to make very, very poor choices. Because in verse 9 we said, For those who are evil will be destroyed. God is going to take care of that. We are under grace. We pray for grace. Pray for them that persecute you. 
But those that hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. They're going to go away permanently. One day they're not going to be seen. That could even happen now. God could, you know, if, if we have revival start in our lives and then it starts spreading like wildfire, the wicked could be gone. The wicked could be gone in your land. But we as believers must turn our eyes upon Jesus and the cross. That is the saving grace. That is the power. God chooses to use the church to be the blaze, to share that. So I encourage you today to, to uh, live, live in the land, share in Christ, looking at your uh, looking up storing treasures in heaven make those praises believe them what you believe will be acted out and in society needs us to be constant so if we have fearful words on our mouths we are going it's an evidence that we believe see we say what we believe so if you are so afraid of of your community and what it's going to be doing. One, be be active. Two, to, yes, take care of yourself. Don't be foolish. But greater is he that is in you. Let them see the peace that you have while you're walking on water. It will make them thirsty to know. Every time a bad situation comes up, you're so peaceful. Why is that? Why you, you know I know you acknowledge that it's going on, but you don't seem overly stressed. Show them what you have. How amazing. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings. Lord, if we are completing our day, I pray um, that that we have a great praise report, that we hear well done, good and faithful servant, and that we will rest, um, have sweet rest. And if we are starting our day, no matter where we are, that uh, we take the time to rejoice and be about your business, that, that the opportunities that you provide us gives us the moments to spread some salt, to spread some light um, in a world that is is seeking. There are those out there seeking, and they need something that's consistent. May we be that consistent um, beacon that that's non-wavering in in all of the things that we do. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Have an amazing day. I love you. Bye.